Hello, everyone. On behalf of AgriLinks, Feed the Future, and the USAID Bureau for Food Security, I would like to welcome you to our webinar today on strengthening private sector extension and advisory services in an international development context. My name is Julie McCarty, and I am your AgriLinks webinar host with the USAID Bureau for Food Security. I'll be your webinar facilitator today, so you'll hear my voice periodically, especially during our question and answer sessions. But before we dive into the content, I would just like to go over a few items to orient you to the webinar. First, please do use the chat box to introduce yourself, to ask questions at any point, and to share any resources you may have that are relevant to the topic today. Um, and thank you to everyone who's introduced yourselves already. We always love to see that we have a global audience for these webinars. We'll be collecting your questions throughout the webinar, and we'll pause after each speaker for a couple of questions. And the speakers will also answer some of the questions in the chat box along the way. And then we'll probably wind up saving the bulk of the questions until after the three presentations today. Lastly, we are recording this webinar, and we will email you the recording, the transcript, and any additional recommended resources once they are ready, uh, perhaps in about a week and a half's time or so. And they'll also be posted on the agrolinks.org website. Okay, onwards to our presentations and our discussions on extension. In today's webinar, the Feed the Future Developing Local Extension Capacity Project, also known as DLEC, will present results of a portfolio review exploring recent experience and potential for expanding private sector extension and advisory services for the ag sector. In addition to the initial presentation on this DLEC study, uh, our webinar today will also cover two case studies of private sector extension, which I'm really excited about, one in Senegal and one in Uganda. The webinar speakers will give recommendations for expanding private sector ag extension services through future USAID projects and through other investments. Okay, I think we're pretty much ready to dive in, so I'm going to introduce our first speaker, uh, who will then introduce our subsequent speakers, and then we can get started. Kristen Davis is a Senior Research Fellow with the International Food Policy Research Institute, or IFPRI, where she has been since 2004. And her work involves research and capacity strengthening on agricultural extension, education, and agricultural innovation systems. And she is currently the project co-director for the DLEC project funded by USAID, which she will be uh, talking about now during our webinar. So I'll pass the microphone over to Kristen, um, and we can get started. Thanks very much, Julie. Good day to everyone. Um, yeah, from my side, I'll be presenting the study that Julie has mentioned uh, on private sector extension. And then we'll be hearing uh, from two case studies from Uganda and Senegal. And as Julie mentioned, there'll be questions uh, in between. You can use the chat box for questions too. So after I present the study, which you can download in the links box on the left, there's a, an overview um, and the full study. Um, after my presentation, we'll hear from Robert and Yang from Kimonics International. Robert's an agricultural value chain improvement and marketing, marketing expert. He's got 23 years of experience applying the facilitative approach to market systems and value chain development. So you'll be hearing about that when he presents the village agent model from Uganda. He's currently the agriculture and food security advisor for Eastern and Southern Africa region for Kimonics. And Robert has worked in extension programs in 19 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, working to strengthen public private extension capacity and also with digital technologies. And then we'll hear also from Jean-Michel uh, Jean Bossard from RTI. Um, he's based in Dakar in Senegal and is a senior market systems advisor at RTI International. And Jean-Michel has worked 20 years in the West African region, linking private sector, banks, grassroots rural organizations to build sustainable market systems that benefit small farmers. And Jean-Michel has been uh, Chief of Party and Technical Advisor to the Feed the Future Natal and Buy project. So he'll be presenting that. But let me give a little bit of introduction uh, to DLEC, Developing Local Extension Capacity. This is a Feed the Future uh, project implemented by Digital Green together with IFPRI, 
Care International, the Global Forum for Rural Advisory Services, and we do work closely with the CGIAR research program on policies, institutions, and markets. DLEC strengthens extension in Feed the Future and um, aligned countries through three interla interrelated sets of activities. These are diagnostics, studies such as we're presenting today on the private sector extension. We've also done uh, 10 or 11 studies on uh, assessments of extension in Feed the Future countries. We also get involved in pilot engagements on the ground in different countries implementing best practices that we found through the diagnostics. And then we bring all the learning from the diagnostics and engagements to the extension community in countries and globally through communities of practice such as we're doing today. So let me dive right in. I think Julie mentioned that we want to summarize lessons learned and also options to expand private sector extension and advisory services. We call it EAS at times through future USAID projects, but also other investments. And the study inputs are including a global literature review. I'll touch on that briefly and also a rapid desk review of USAID investments in 28 um, Feed the Future and aligned countries. As I'm sure you're aware, extension is recognized as essential for programs who are trying to transform ag systems, governments, and other investors who want to address global social and economic development objectives, such as reducing food insecurity, poverty, et cetera. And both public and private organizations are active in extension and advisory services in most countries. Just to define for you, who are we talking about with private sector actors? And you'll hear excellent examples from Robert and Jean-Michel. We're talking about basically all the non-governmental actors. So we're talking about both uh, nonprofit and for-profit entities. These include civil society and NGOs, who are trying to advance their organizational mandate. It includes input suppliers and other for-profit entities. Um, they want to sell products. They want to please their customers. It includes people like product buyers who are trying to get adequate supplies of good quality commodities. We also have consultants and consulting firms who are selling their services. The media are also often for-profit uh, marketing information services. And then we have producer organizations who want to service or represent their group's interests. So we'll be hearing about them in more detail from my presentation and the case studies. The private sector has always complemented public sector extension and advisory services. And you might notice in the report and in the presentation that we talk a lot about the public sector still. And that comes because of um, the portfolio review that we did. We saw a strong role still of the, of the public sector. They are um, important to complement the private sector and essential really to meet objectives of different development partners. And so that's why you hear about the public sector in this private sector webinar. But I'd like to jump also into the um, literature review. Why the private sector? Why private sector extension and advisory services? Well, there's a lot of potential for private sector in terms of providing sustainability of extension services, of meeting needs of farmers. And I'll, I'll mention a few of these here. They do increase profits to both the service provider and to the clientele of the farmer. So there's shared value there. It's also used to strengthen long-term business relationships Private sector is good for promoting innovation and in service delivery, including use of ICTs. And the private sector helps to ensure adequate quantities and quality of market products. And they do participate as, as financers, as service providers, as users of extension and advisory services. And we saw that most USAID extension and advisory service projects implement uh, by using private contractors or grantees. In addition to the potential of private sector, there's, of course, limitations as well. And of course, one of these is that they need cost recovery. They're trying to get their costs back and even make some money in providing these services. And as a result, the coverage isn't always perfect. It's sometimes limited to people who can afford to pay for services, to people with the higher value crops and other products. 
sometimes there's a perceived or an actual conflict of interest for people like maybe some input providers who people think are just trying to flog their product without necessarily you know caring about the bigger picture of what the producers need there's also uh, the case that many extension providers from the private sector actually lack experience they lack capacity and interest in extension and advisory service provision there's also the issue of the nature of innovations. You know, there's the public versus the private good. And so certain innovations are better for the private sector because commercialization is possible. And then there's other goods such as public goods, natural resource management and so forth that is less interesting for the private sector. So that's quickly a review of the literature. Uh, we wanna make time for the case studies, but now I wanna walk into the portfolio review we looked at 28 Feed the Future and Aligned Countries. They're listed here, and we've been in touch with many of you. Um, we looked at 133 projects from the year 2010 to 2019. And these projects that we looked at, these programs were actually quite complex. They had on average 3.6 different components or objectives, and some had more than 10. Um, so it's quite a lot that they were taking on. Only five of the projects were solely extension and advisory services. And these two of these were actually implemented by USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture. And about five to 10% of the funding of these projects were for the extension and advisory services component. So that's an overview of what we looked at for the portfolio review. What we found, uh, we looked at, first of all, some design considerations when we looked at these 28 countries and 133 projects. Design of, of programs is important because it establishes the base for investment success or failure. It determines the nature and extent of the impact. And what we found is there appeared to be some significant design issues for extension and advisory services and for effective private sector participation in the systems. The first of these is that there appeared to be a weak analytical base for design. A lot of the planning seemed to have been maybe ad hoc, done by contractors and grantees during planning or as they started implementation. And it didn't seem like the strategy and approach was necessarily linked to some evidence base. Relatedly, we didn't find much of a, an evidence base for the content that was being promoted. So we weren't sure why these innovations were being promoted and how they were linked back to the needs um, from the clientele. Thirdly, as I mentioned, the projects are quite complex. You know, there's a lot of activities in many of these projects. There's extension services, financial services, input supply, producer organizations, irrigation, mechanization, market development. All of these are needed to enable change at the farm level. But of course, with so much complexity, so much going on, it's hard to give due attention to the extension component specifically. And then we found very ambitious targets. Many of these were actually met or even exceeded, but one wonders when you're trying to reach such large targets in clientele, does it compromise the quality and the intensity of the services? So those are some design considerations. We also looked at some of the implementation considerations too. And as I mentioned, we found this surprisingly strong reliance on public extension and advisory services. This was true in almost all the projects, even those with weak extension services. And of course, it's necessary to gain access to communities, validate legitimacy, and of course, to provide content backup and so forth. But that was found across the board. In terms of methodologies, very traditional, we found farmer training, demonstration, field days, and a sprinkling of others like mass media, fairs, and so forth, which is fine. Um, traditional methodologies are great where they work. Um, and as you see in point three, radio was very common and very effective. Um, but we found limited applications of other information and communication technologies, or ICTs. And effective communication is really at the heart of extension and advisory services. So we might want to consider other applications of ICTs. Fourthly, subsidies for inputs uh, were very common. They're often used to encourage adoption, uh, which is great. But they are well known to distort market decisions and to be unsustainable. 
of course, <laughs> most EAS programs are essentially subsidies themselves. So then the issue becomes, what do we subsidize, how much, and for how long? And then lastly, decentralization was a common issue. 15 countries had decentralized their public systems. While carrying potential benefits, they can be really chaotic, disruptive, um, they give new responsibilities, it requires, you know, different financial arrangements, different budgeting, and so forth. So it's, it's quite a long process and takes a lot of thinking. We then looked at the different project roles that we found um, across the board, and we found that producer organizations were ubiquitous. They were used in all of the projects in all the countries. Most projects or, or evaluation reports that we looked at identified them as needed strengthening, but very little was actually provided. And now you'll hear more from Jean-Michel about the use of producer organizations in, in the project he's presenting. Contact, lead farmers, farmer volunteers, there's many different names. These were also ubiquitous and they're important because they link the providers and the communities, they expand the reach. Um, but of course, you know, there's, there's issues with them which we can discuss if we have time at the end as well. And then you'll be hearing more from Robert about the input dealers, but they were very common as well across the board. There's a strong common interest for promoting the use of inputs from both, you know, the projects and the input providers themselves. But we did find that the capacity, the range of services of input providers was often limited. I want to move now to just talking about how can we invest? What do we want to promote so that we can expand and strengthen private sector extension and advisory services? What interventions can we bring in? And I realize this is a very long list, but I'm going to talk about each of these points one by one. <clears throat> Excuse me. So firstly, I think this is a big systems area. We need to develop national extension policies and strategies, or if they are already developed, they need to be strengthened and implemented. So the coherent public sector policies on extension are key. They provide an enabling environment. They either enable or disenable private sector to come in, and so they're very important. And one intervention here for funders, whether they be programs or projects or funders of any type, including government, you can support formulation of national extension and advisory service policies. A second intervention is to strengthen the public sector. This, as I said before, is a bit counterintuitive, but the public sector really serves as a backbone of the full extension an advisory service system. So it's important to have a strong public sector so that we can have a strong private sector as well. Thirdly, we need to improve support services for extension. These include things like training, research, subject matter specialist backstopping, communications, monitoring and evaluation, and so forth. This is important for the private sector. Fifthly, we want to strengthen producer organizations. They are private sector entities. They're key players for effective and sustainable extension systems. And I think more intentional effort is needed to bring more innovative approaches and to develop further these organizations. And I think we'll hear more about that from Jean-Michel. The sixth point is to strengthen the input suppliers. They were also an important element for private sector extension. And here we want to focus on improving professionalism, management, quality consciousness, and things like that. There's other private sector providers also that need strengthening. Number seven, we need, we need to strengthen potential private sector providers um, who might be weak. It might be more efficient, it might be more preferable to strengthen their capacity, give them business plans and business models before expecting them to engage effectively in provision of EIS themselves. Number eight, we want to strengthen quality certification systems. So we're, when we're talking about the private sector, we want to pay attention to the quality, the objectivity, the qualifications of these different providers, and their accountability. And a possibility here might be to fund technical assistance, training, or development costs for a system 
to establish standards to register certified extension providers. I think Robert's going to touch on that in his presentation from Uganda. And then number nine, there's a need to strengthen and to establish stakeholder consultation programs. Things like uh, innovation platforms where you bring together the public sector, the private sector, researchers, agribusiness, farmers to address specific problems or opportunities. And then there's the issue of subsidies. Um, so, you know, you might want to subsidize so that you're promoting adoption or uptake of innovations early in a project. So you might want to think about strategically subsidizing and, and give things maybe for free or subsidize initially or, or to get things going. Um, but be aware and have a sort of an exit strategy for how you're going to phase that out in the end. And then finally, the last investment intervention, I think, is to actually directly fund extension delivery. And this is especially the case where it might be appropriate for post-crisis countries, fragile states, where you're serving disadvantaged populations or in natural resource conservation programs. So these kinds of programs have an advantage that there's a direct link between the funding and the clientele and their impacts. The disadvantage, on the other hand, is that they're generally time, time limited, they're not sustainable, and they're limited in terms of scale as well. One more slide, and then I'll talk about um, how DLEC can come in and, and help um, some of the missions and so forth on this. But we sort of bucket these four recommendations according to four different scenarios, from a very weak public and weak private extension system to a very strong and strong public and strong private system. And if you look in the report on the, on the left that you can download, you'll find preliminary recommendations for each of the 28 countries, uh, the 28 portfolios that we reviewed. Of course, these recommendations are, are highly tentative because this was a rapid review. More detailed analysis is needed, but we can offer that. I'll tell you in a minute how. So starting in the top uh, box, if you have a weak public and a weak private um, system, like in post-crisis countries, those with limited economic development, you might want to have direct delivery. So you want to address these immediate needs. Um, and you want to focus probably on capacity development as a high priority, especially that of producer organizations. Moving down to the second row, if you do have a weak public but a strong private system, this is probably rare if it exists at all, but you can think about pockets of strong private sector extension, maybe in countries that have plantation crops or something like that. Here you want to establish the necessary foundation. You want to provide capacity for the public sector as a priority. And then the third scenario where you have a strong public um, but a weak private sector extension, here's where you want to target support to strengthen the private sector and have support services strengthen, technical specialist support, and communications as well. And then lastly, if you're in a fortuitous situation that has a strong public and a strong private sector, you have the basis for a strong and effective national system. And activities here from donors and other funders should strengthen capacities, but also focus on coordination and maybe gaps in serving underserved clientele as well. So the takeaway here that we really want to give you from the report is that this is a call to investment in national extension and advisory service system development. So looking at the whole picture, all the different providers from a pluralistic environment. I think the system development is key for sustainability, efficiency, effectiveness of the private sector. And it's been neglected in the past um, with inadequate attention to local capacity development and to analytical work in extension and advisory services. There's a lot more recommendations um, in the overview that you can download and in the file, the full file as well, that I hope you'll take a look at and give us comments on. I just want to close here before I turn it back to Julie with mentioning that DLEC, the Developing Local Extension Capacity Project, can assist USAID missions with analyses, further analysis, like a deep dive into why um, the private sector 
is not working or how it can be strengthened, we can help with project design, review scopes of works, or help with workshops um, for project design and implementation, suggest consultants, um, and even do evaluation of extension and advisory service activities. So with that, I'm going to pause, let Julie see if there's some key questions we want to answer before turning over to Robert to present the case study on Uganda. Great. Thank you so much, Kristen, for that excellent presentation. We've had a few um, questions come in that I'll pose to you before we move on. Um, let's see. So, uh, Judy Payne, a uh, former USAID um, member, um, asked, do you have any sense of the number of farmers reached by various approaches in this study? Radio is, of course, common and effective. Do you have any numbers on other digital tools or services? Thanks. Hi. Hi, Judy. I knew we'd uh, hear from you on the digital side. Um, I, we don't have specific, we, we didn't aggregate as to the number reached by different um, tools and approaches. In all from the, the review, the portfolio review, um, it was reported that 89 million farmers were reached. So it was a huge reach, um, but I think it was through all the different methods. Um, and of course, radio reaches probably by far the most of them, but we don't have specific information at the at this report level of how many were reached by the different digital tools. Uh, great, thank you. And uh, a question from Gordon Otieno Lanzare. How do you assess the strength weakness of an extension and advisory service, public or private? Is there a specific tool that you use for assessing this? Thanks, Gordon. We don't have a specific tool. I think there's people working on these types of issues. Um, we can sort of use the elements that I've outlined here in, in the presentation and the report. And if you go to download the huge report, the big full report, um, we have sort of a decision tree at the end, which can help you to see which direction you should go in in order to intervene. Um, but I can, I can talk to you maybe, I can use the chat box after and, and talk about um, some other initiatives that are going on to assess um, extension in general, not just private sector. Uh, great, thank you. I think we'll, we'll throw in one or two more uh, short questions and then um, Kristen, if, if you also wouldn't mind helping to answer some in the chat box once Robert gets underway. Um, so let's see. Uh, Liz Ogutu asked, do you have any scenario timescales for how long it would take to implement some of these best fit recommendations, assuming some regionality or shared environment, et cetera? Um, uh, scenario timelines. Everything takes longer than you expect. Um, for instance, I, I've, I'm based in South Africa and I, I've been assisting or I had assisted with the development of a national extension policy and, and it took years. Um, I know, you, you know, Uganda has been going through something similar and, and Malawi is in the, in the process of sort of revising their national policy. It, it takes a long time and you have to be ready, you know, for sort of the long haul in some of these systems development areas. In terms of regionality, um, yeah, I'm assuming you're talking about learning a, across the region. Um, but yeah, I think we always need to plan for longer, longer than we expect. Great. And perhaps one more, um, let's see, question. Let me check on what we've got here. Um, Do you have any um, any plans, perhaps, for a, a question from Erna Abedin? Are there any plans for how to link this USAID-funded program to any nonprofit NGOs outside of USAID or, or to other entities outside of USAID or outside of IFPRI? Uh, 
Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so so the developing local extension capacity is a is a feed the future project that's focused on feed the future countries. Those are listed. Um, I'll share the link, or somebody can share the link in the chat box in a moment. What the feed the future countries are, um, but we do work with other partners um, depending on what the needs are in that country. So, for instance, um, in Nigeria, we worked with a private sector. Um, company that wasn't, you know, part of, of Feed the Future necessarily. Um, and in other countries, we've been working with with NGOs in Bangladesh, for instance. So it's not, you know, we can link up with other with other um, nonprofit entities depending on, you know, the joint interests, the the shared objectives in the country where we're working. Great, thank you, Kristen. Um, in the interest of time, I think we can move along, but we will continue to address questions in the chat box uh, and at the end of the presentation. Uh, so next, we'll move along to Robert An Yang for his portion of the presentation. Right. Uh, thank you, Julie. There we go. And thank uh, you, Robert, Christine. please take it away. Thank you, Julie, and thanks a lot, Christian, for that wonderful presentation. I, I'm also very super excited to talk about extension after spending 19 years trying to find ways to make it cheaper and affordable to small scale farmers. Uh, the late Norman Bullock used to tell us, I, I actually worked for Sasekawa Africa Association before I joined Chemonics. He used to say, take technology closer to the farmers in terms of innovation and information. And he used to employ us, find means of doing that so that it can be sustainable. Over the years, we tried so many models with Farmer League's approach, the, uh, uh, the uh, I call it community-based facilitating. By the end of the day, as soon as we stop funding it, it all stops. So we start thinking, how do we do it better? And that's what I want to share with you today. We all know in extension, the biggest cost is not wages or salary. The biggest cost is logistics and training. Actually, logistics takes 58% of all extension delivery, both public and private sector extension systems. Now, let's talk about the public extension delivery system in Uganda. I'm sure it's not different from any other countries. We, we do have a, a ratio of extension worker to farmer at one, one, uh, one extension worker to 1,800 farmers. Uh, maybe in countries like um, Ethiopia, you can find one to 500 meaning we are not reaching out to the farmers in a proper way. And if you take a look at the, at both the private sector, you know the private sector has about four models they promote. The farmer-led model, which is mostly to improve farmer situation and offer them better opportunities, which I did for 14 years, and to empower farmers. And we, the donors, keep on funding it. As soon as we pull out, it, it goes back to the same way we met it. The global sourcing model is a, is a well-known model across in big commodities, um, mostly to secure large supplies and have large impact on, uh, on farmers. But they also have their drawbacks. Mostly you find uh, there's a high risk of size selling by the same producers. And they sometimes don't offer the systems of commercial service to these farmers. Then we have the local traders models. They're very efficient in sourcing. They reach the farmer home. They, they, they are these guys you find on bicycle going to a farmer's home to pick up one bag of maize. But they do, there's always issue of mistrust among each of them, and, and definitely always cause problems between farmers and traders. Then we have the specialized models that like, uh, Christine mentioned about consultants. Yeah, these are the ones trying to uh, improve and innovate agricultural value chains, use of ICT, uh, use of means of reaching farmers, but make it for a profit. But it also has its own drawbacks. It has high initial cost of investment. So we keep on thinking, how do we do it in an effective and affordable way? I, I was the chief of party of a project called the Commodity Production and Market Activity in Uganda that ended in March 2018. And then we decided to combine four of these models together. The farmer-led models, the specialized models, the local traders, and the global sourcing. And we found a commonality among all this. We tried to find out who is the last person that reached out to the farmer. In all these models, they all have what we call an agent. 
And why do you decide to work with such people? We believe the biggest problem in supply chain is size selling and reaching out to in terms of quality and, and, and quantity. So, but, but working with the same guys that does the most havoc, which are the traders, maybe we're able to improve the system by coaching and mentoring them. So, under that program, we came what we call the village agent model. And this is how it works. It's a market-driven approach. We first engage the market pool. The market pool means the end buyer, the person that signals what he wants in terms of quantity and quality. It's, it's either an exporter or, or end buyer or large processing companies. Then he and the five traders. Traders can be cooperatives or farm organizations or producer organizations or mainly traders, individual traders. And they sign contracts and say, okay, this is what we want to do. This is the amount of maize or coffee or beans I like to buy. So can you please make up uh, how you're going to do the production contract? The trader signs the contract with the exporter, and the trader identifies village agents who are loyal to him. Remember, the village agent is the one that lives in the village with the, with the farmer. He is the one people used to call the shark, the coyote, the loan shark that gives loans to farmers at a high rate. But he knows every farmer in the village because he stays in there. And he is the point of entry because he moves from home to home to pick a bag of maize or two bags of maize. So if you train those ones to provide extension in terms of production and marketing services, maybe you will, able to, will be able to improve the life of the farmer. Because remember I said, the biggest cost in extension is logistics. This agent goes from home to home to pick back of maize without being paid, but they get a commission for doing it. So they are being motivated by based on the volume they collect and which they get paid by their traders in terms of commission. So what do we do as CPM? We call it the Community Production Market Activity. We mentor and coach them in different services under pre-production, production, post-service, production, post and marketing services. And part of them, we, we train them to be crop insurance agents because there's a demand for crop insurance. We train them to be input su uh, supply services because they can actually forecast demand between the needs of the farmer and the seed companies. They provide planting services. They were training within services. We actually train them in 14 services, but an agent takes only four to five of these services to get himself occupied the whole year. Let me tell you what makes it interesting for them to do it. The agent makes an average of $4,000 a season profit from doing this, by providing these services. And that's the motivation that drives them to reach out to the farmers. Knowing fully well, the more farmers we improve their production, the more commission I get from my trader. And how do they deliver services to farmers? Because they are used to visit farmers at their home, so individual farm visits was easy for them to understand, to do. But we incorporate things like ammunition videos on their tablets. I, I think uh, Christian was being talked about a digital means of reaching farmers. We develop animation videos to help them uh, pass the message in a very eloquent way to farmers. Because you know, most of these people are not well trained extension workers. So we have to make sure the message is clear and able to deliver it. They also promote, uh, do extension delivery by doing what we call demand created demonstrations. These are the typical demonstrations they have signed contracts with input companies. But this is to create demand so they can make money from it. And they often provide direct service to farmers by going there to spray, uh, take care of their coffee, and wait for them, or maize. Other methods we use was use the IC, uh, IEC, because definitely they are very versatile in, in, in communicating in their local languages. So we translated with the Ministry of Agriculture all the extension materials into local languages for them to be able to use the delivered farmers. And it's often to use uh, organized group training and home visits. Among all these extension delivery methods they use, the individual visits and home visits was the most common among, which was effective to reach out to numbers of farmers. How do they make money and sustain the model? And a bag of, on one bag of fertilizer they sell, an agent makes within five to six dollar profits. So meaning, if I have 200 farmers working for me, I sell 200 bags of fertilizers, that means I can be able to get $1,200. And how are we sure they get this money? 
Remember, every seed company or fertilizer company needs to reach out to the farmer. The cost of them reaching out to the farmer is almost around 35%. So this money is now, half of it is now given to the agent. Because they will find out where the farmers are and they will deliver the fertilizer to the farmer at his doorstep. And also provide what we call embedded services. And this has worked well. And in terms of soil testing, they provide soil testing, they make like $5. Working with the uh, soil testing companies uh, like the Macarius, when they spray, they make about $0.5 on every liter. They make money along the chain, every service they provide. Overall, I, I always like to measure impact and say, okay, has this make any changes? In the period of five years from 2013 to 2018, we found a lot of changes. I, I'll go through just quick to the slide that talks about that relates to extension. Our target was to reach out to uh, numbers of farmers who have applied new technologies. Our baseline was 52,000, but, but because the extension, uh, the village agent model worked effectively, we were able to reach 596,000. The average numbers of farmer to an agent was around 200 per, per agent, meaning closer and easy to, to manage. The investment by the private sector, because they found that they could get more supplies is to, and, and more, uh, better uh, quality. They invested in things like uh, process facilities. They invested in things like uh, uh, provide loans to traders to buy more. And you can also see the inputs delivery. Over a period of five years, this agent were able to sell $5 million worth of inputs that reached out to farmer. And we, we did a survey trying to find out how many of these farmers actually annoyed the positive benefits of using inputs, we found out that 73% of these people appreciate them, village agent delivering service to them in a better way. Now, in every model, there's things that can make it fail, and I'm going to talk about this more. During our inception period, we found out most people tend to say the traders are the bad people to work with, and most donors and angels don't want to associate with them. But if you look at the value chain, the trader has been there all these days and meaning we can work with the traders to reach out to the farmers because they are the closest in that model to the farmer if a donor refuses to work with the middle actors the va will not work because every farmer sees the donors and ngos as the next atm machine meaning they look for free services they are looking for dependence on a uh, subsidization if there's no access to finance it will not work and if there's no lack of uh, instrument to enforce better trading practice and behaviors among actors, the model will not work. So all this must be considered when you're trying to do this. What have we learned? There must be a link to a buyer. You cannot increase production without selling it out. Village agents need to be trained about the service they offer. The jobs they create must be perceived as formal. Formal must be willing to pay for service in cash or in kind at the same time of delivery. ICT is key to reduce costs of transaction. And there must be a behavior change strategy for all actors to work together. Over the years, the government of Uganda adopted the model and then it falls under what they call the National Agricultural Extension Policy, where you have all extension services, both public and private sector, come to work together. And the government currently right now they are providing support to certify these agents. They provide salaries for their staff to reach out to these agents and also provide the essential materials for these agents to work on. The private sector, they support the, uh, the essential uh, workers with stipends to enable them to organize training and also support their traders, VAs, to disseminate the knowledge and conduct demonstrations. And I think this is a perfect way where you find how you can strengthen both public and private sector. We know the public sector does not have sufficient money of funds to reach out to farmers. But the private sector is willing to provide stipends to support the government session worker to train village agents who in turn train the farmers. And it's easy to manage. So what is unique about the agent, about village agent model? It's market driven. Services are brought closer to farmer because the agents live in the same village with the farmer. Inputs, genuine inputs. Because the agent is closer to the farmer, there's no way he's going to sell fake, fake inputs compared to stockists who live in town. 
there's real time guidance. The farmer can reach out to the to the to the agent who's, who lives next door to him. It's self sustaining because the agent makes money with this world chain and it creates employment. I'd like to talk about the top takeaways here. Remember, all key four actors should be involved exporter, traders, agent, and farmer. Technology is key and innovations to deliver better services. Farmers should be willing to pay for service in kind or cash. You must build motivation and incentives around service delivery. Relation building is key based on trust and loyalty. You need to enhance agents' knowledge in relevant fields. And access to finance by all the four main actors is key. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Robert. Uh, we'll pause here for a few questions for you as we've had some great questions for you come in. Uh, the first one that I'll ask you is from Mark Blackett, who asks, what do you think of the strategy for the Ministry of Ag in Uganda to lead on the village agent model? Do you think this should be a joint initiative with the Ministry of Trade, Industry, and Cooperatives? Uh, thank you, Mark. Yes, I believe it should be joint effort between the Ministry of Trade should take the lead of uh, trying to promote the village agent model in this aspect, because uh, this falls trade falls under the Ministry of Trade, and definitely working to the district commercial officers. But the Ministry of Agriculture can provide the TA to improve the production part of it. Remember, this model is both production and marketing. The production size is where the Ministry of Agriculture try to make sure to improve the yields by training the VAs to provide the right services. The marketing part is where the Ministry of Trade takes off the trading component of it. But overall, it must be a joint initiative. Right now, we definitely have a, uh, a joint initiative between the Ministry of Trade and Industries and the Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Local Government. These are the three key partners who are taking initiative in this. Great, thank you, Robert. Um, let's see. An interesting question. Um, let's see, from Jonathan Hubchen. How do you ensure that the village agent model promotes improved cultural practices and not just input? I believe. The, 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 uh, uh, thanks, Jonathan. The existence of a village agent is based on a two way working with the uh, with the farmer, because input is part of it, but remember, input alone cannot deliver the uh, the yield you want. So he must train the farmers to adopt better practices, and in doing so, he is ensure that better yield is there. So the training they get from things like donors, like uh, uh, like uh, like our program, and also the Ministry of Agriculture, is to, for them to train farmers better how to use the inputs. Input is not only the end means; we have a lot to do within it. Most of these agents are also involved in output marketing, but they do both ways, input and output marketing. So they have to make sure that the yield is sustained for them, for the farmers to get more yield, so they can buy more from the farmers. So definitely beyond inputs, they have to train farmers on how to improve their cultural practices. And Jonathan, let, 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 let me be honest with you, they do it because of the motivation of getting more, more yield from the farmers by training these people. Thanks so much, Robert. Um, another couple of questions. I'll, I'll combine a couple from Gordon Wanzari and from Henry Peary. What are some of the risks associated with the village agents? For example, monopoly in the village, bias towards some farming families, trust or mistrust, and how do the project handle these risks? Um, and kind of in a similar vein, what is uh, one way to eliminate people's mistrust of agents in this model? Uh, thank you very much. As I said, one of the key things we need to do is you have to have a behavioral change strategy in place. Because the mistrust has been a long way. It cannot change overnight. So do, uh, during the program, we try to create a relationship between traders and farmers, bring them together to understand what are the key problems affecting the relationships. We spend over two years doing that out of the five years. And when the farmer sees that he needs the agent more, and the agency needs the farmer, then they have what we call a lawyer and trust. 
and we develop some materials that assist them to able to understand. The biggest problem in mistrust between an agent and a, and a farmer is, che is, uh, is cheating. Uh, most farmers will say uh, traders cheat us by tampering with the scales. And most traders will say farmers cheat us by adding stones in the bag. So we decided to tamper with the scales. But when you build a, a, a very good bigger chain strategy, teaching everybody, the reason why you're trying to cheat each other is because your production is not efficient. And the VA here is going to train you how to produce better. Instead of you getting eight bags of maize in an acre, you can definitely get 20 bags an acre. So why do you decide to cheat by adding stones to it? And this in turn returns back to the agent. It doesn't need to tamper with the, with the, with the, with the scale anymore. Now, how do you reduce monopoly? Now, let me tell you, farmers know what to do. There's no issue of monopoly. A farmer living in a village will definitely choose who to work with. They, they know good agents and they know bad agents. They know who has been assisting them in time of their need. So it's the choice is made up to the farmer, and the farmer will just decide who to work with. In a village, you may find about four agents working for different traders, or you may find one agent, four, four traders, uh, one, uh, four village agents working for one trader. But the farmer is wise enough to decide who he wants to work with based on the relationship he has viewed a long time ago. Great. Thank you so much, Robert. Uh, let me just toss out one or two more questions to you before we move on. Um, let's see. All right. So from Emily Romero, just a quick question. Uh, Robert, who sustains the cost of the ICTs and data storage in your model? The farmer sustains this with the trader. The data collected, uh, currently right now, farmers are paying about Two dollars to get the land, uh, to get the land's profile, the land size, the data collected from them. It costs about two dollars, and I believe two dollars is like a five kilos of maize. All right. But now, so often traders pay for this on behalf of the farmer and deduct it from the maize when they're delivering it. So, and that data is kept by a company called Aquarion and other ones in, in, in the cycle, and this is how it's sustaining itself. But in Uganda, the actual cost for collecting that data is only $2, which is sometimes 5 kilos of maize or 2 kilos of beans. And a trader can go ahead and pay on behalf of the farmer and deduct it when the farmer is delivering the goods to him. Um, great. Thank you, Robert. In the interest of time, I think we'll move on to our next case study and next presenter. Um, but Robert, please do take a look at the additional questions that have come in for you in case you can answer some in the chat box. And of course, we can also answer some more um, at the end of the presentation. So I'd like to pass the microphone over to Jean-Michel Vazard, who has a, another case study for us. Jean-Michel? OK. Hello, Julie. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, you sound clear. OK, great. Well, hello, everyone from Senegal. Okay, so uh, this is about the uh, Senegal Natal Bike project, which actually was closed out last June. Uh, Senegal Natal Bike was a feed the future value chain activity that targeted Senegal's three main cereals: rice, maize, and millet. Uh, it came after a predecessor project called Projet Croissance Economique that had successfully tested a bottom-up approach that relied on local farmer organizations for the delivery of extension and value chain services. So Nathan Bay's goal was to scale the adoption of technologies and practices that were identified as promising and that uh, network model uh, was expected to be scaled up. Now, Nathan Bay as a project had a very ambitious coverage target uh, the idea was to cover 40% on average of the household, the rural households of its zone of influence, which is quite large. It also had uh, ambitious uh, technical goals, for example, uh, achieving widespread geographic and population coverage, making sure that adoption of technologies was lasting across the board and that 
All of this results in systemic uh, transformations in the delivery of production, post-harvest, and financial services. So we were really looking at something transformational. Um, however, apart from direct technical assistance and facilitation, the project was only able to rely on the subcontracting fund with a focus on local service contracts, and we did not have any grant facilities. So, uh, wait, wait, wait. Here we go. Okay, sorry I went through that first intro slide, but the most important one is the next one. So strategically, to be able to achieve that scaling and, uh, and also having in-depth technology adoption, we, the project established its total footprint during the first year, I mean, right from the start. This gave it four seasonal cycles over which uh, targeted communities could progressively adopt technologies and practices while expanding their membership through what you know, is today called the scaling in process. Uh, the project then selected, therefore selected a base of 120 pre-established producer networks made up mainly of cooperatives, but also some very local NGOs and a handful of SME aggregators that relied exclusively on smallholder sourcing in a structured way. Now, these networks were contracted on a year-to-year -year basis to be the ones that deliver productivity training and develop new value chain services in an independent way. Now, under these contracts, networks typically needed to set up a homegrown extension team composed of a database manager, uh, field agents and lead farmers who acted as village contact points. Uh, the database managers and uh, the database managers and the field agent roles required advanced literacy and the ability to adopt IT technologies, and so were generally recruited locally by the networks amongst the zone's young educated youth. There are some, uh, even in the most remote area but the minimum uh, schooling level was set at 10th grade level, and that was sufficient to ensure uh, uh, competent database managers. So, as we said, you know, the project picked up on a technological portfolio that was inherited from PCE, but that eventually evolved. Uh, the idea here is, was to have the networks progressively become uh, trusted market agents at their community level, a result that had been partially attained under the, uh, not on, on the, the predecessor project. So this market-driven extension went beyond strict agronomic messaging and sought to strengthen the agency of the farmer-based organizations within the value chain, so really make them full-fledged market actors. Uh, Several of these packages were adapted from national extension technical documents, seed regulations, research, meteo technical recommendations, but also inspired by private sector practices and requirements so that output could conform to norm. By the end of the project, this footprint uh, and the networks had developed a zone of influence footprint of 5,000 field-based agents. Uh, who provide services to more than 150,000 farmers, and generally the ratio for the contact points is 1 to 30 and one to, or 1 to 50, which is, uh, you know, an efficient way of ensuring constant outreach. The representation of women within the extension system, this private extension system, uh, is still far from past. Oh, hi everyone. Um, I have we have also lost Jean-Michel temporarily. Uh, he's joining us from Senegal, and so there may be an um, issue with his phone. If you wouldn't mind hanging tight for just a moment while we try to get him back, uh, that would be excellent. Got to roll with the punches on these webinars. Um, the Hello. sound's been so great so far, so we're uh, preparing to get him back. Okay, I'm back here. Oh. moment. Hello. There you are. Excellent. Sorry about that. Up? Yes. No Sorry. Problem. Uh, where are we at? Did you pick up? Uh, we only okay. lost maybe 
30 seconds of your time. Okay, I was talking about I was talking about gender disparity. Did you hear about that? Uh, I'd say that's a good place to pick up. Okay, so uh, the representation of women in the system is not at parity. 20% uh, of database managers are women, and 23% of field agents, and 18% of lead farmers. Now, by comparison, 40% of the total farmer population reached by the project were women. So that comes from various factors. First, well, corn, millet, and irrigated rice uh, are traditionally male-dominated commodities. Rain-fed rice itself is uh, a woman's crop with 64% of women practicing it. But the key element was the differing literacy levels amongst genders, and that played a role, and as did the requirement for mobility between communities, which favors men for the field agent roles. However, the improving rural literacy with young women is gradually changing that uh, profile. Now, just a moment. Now, the approach here, uh, since we were establishing a footprint for continuity, the idea was to provide continuous facilitation and gradually have networks progress in terms of competencies and autonomy. So you, the initial objective was to have uh, farmers work with their membership to achieve a productivity level that, were, that produced consistent surpluses, uh, gradually uh, progressing to developing sound input financing plans and marketing plans, uh, finding intensification solutions in terms of mechanization practices, and gradually, you know, being able to manage a web of various contractual arrangements with banks, insurance companies, input providers, uh, et cetera, and even developing linkages with the National Extension Service to do information exchange. Now. Uh, this required a, a learning element, so we, the project facilitated uh, learning loops, you know, from year to year, various networks would meet at the regional and uh, crop level to, to exchange best practices and uh, would discuss issues such as seed variety performance, would discuss quality standards, pricing thresholds, climate response strategies, and in the end would adopt their uh, internal functioning to take account of the various recommendations that they made themselves. Now, uh, an innovative element of the program was to uh, download completely the data processing work at the farmer level uh, using very uh, basic uh, data services off the shelf or uh, open source, and having the farmers uh, manage it themselves. Uh, so that really had a big impact in, uh, in building trust and, and, and building competency. It, it turned the uh, farmer-led extension into a data-driven process. Uh, people were talking in numbers, it's establishing sowing thresholds in terms of duration at a certain number of millimeters. Uh, you know, and assessing yields with high precision and even doing cross-year comparisons. I mean, I've been told that someone uh, assisted at a crop meeting and said that he was surprised to have farmers, regular farmers, talking about their three-year yield profiles and saying how they were progressing. Now, the data, getting data processing services at the farmer level was also a staged program. It was like a learning uh, activity that had networks to start with a profiling phase, like learning how to profile their membership, so working with static databases, but that were descriptive and enabled them to really monitor who was who and who had what uh, in terms of product and capacity. Then fall, it was followed by a more analytical learning phase where uh, the focus was put on how to mine those statistics and assess their own performance, and finally the more advanced teams graduated to real-time data to support more transactional and tracking activities such as like loan and insurance applications, input procurement and distribution, real-time local weather data collection, and just managing overall crop aggregation. Now these, uh, these 
system did not work uh, in a vacuum or let's say in just within the network. I mean, throughout the program, these uh, farmers use this data to enter, interact with their partners, interact with government authorities, uh, interact you know, with the environment at large. And the, the effect has been uh, to build a climate of trust and really an evidence-based uh, climate of discussion, uh, both with trading partners, farmers, and the government. And that was a very critical element in terms of reinforcement. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, an element, and I'll, I'll be quick on that one because that's a subject in itself, but I just want to mention that uh, uh, the level of reinforcement attained by these farmer organizations really made them like independent agents in negotiating with the outside world. And so we call that you know, a shift from a, a classic vertical structure where you have a central organizing firm or entity that groups all that and, and does a lot of work on the farmer's behalf to a system where the farmers are empowered to transact with a, a variety of, of banks, of uh, clients, of service providers, input uh, providers, and, and are able to get the best possible price. And so uh, that uh, actually was very conducive in building value and it was an essentially you know, very data-driven process. Just to say that you know these farmer organizations on their own like managed uh, successfully more than 150 million dollars in short-term loans. Uh, 34,000 of them managed to access agricultural insurance. Uh, it, it stimulated the emergence of uh, mechanized service providers uh, in terms of land preparation and harvesting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean that. The, the indicators are interesting, and uh, but what's more interesting is the agency that the networks had in developing those linkages and those activities. The, now, the project closed out last June, okay? So that's pretty much a hard stop. I mean, Senegal still eventually will be getting Feed the Future support, but this season, uh, the farmers have been left spending for themselves. So what happened? Did everything go crashing? Now you see on the slide, uh, Nimna Diaite, president of Sepromas. Well, I met with her along with uh, a few networks across the country, went to visit just to see what was going on. I mean, for, for the current rain season. Are they, are they carrying on? And uh, what's interesting is that the majority of them, I mean, all the ones I visited, I know that a few smaller organizations don't yet have the, their full autonomy. But most of them uh, have been able to maintain and grow their service level to farmers. Uh, they maintain loans, those who were working with loan applications, managing uh, insurance, all these elements uh, were maintaining their activity. And some even had begun diversifying uh, their portfolio of activities by monitoring horticulture and livestock activities. Each group we surveyed had developed its own cost recovery approach through a mix of rationalization of the extension team, adaptation of the databases to simplify them, uh, introduction or increase in membership dues, and developing service charges for specific services such as real-time rainfall tracking and GPS field surveying. Some of them uh, had deals with the insurance company to have commission on the management of the uh, insuring process and, and you know, selling insurance. And uh, also, they, some of them negotiated deals with input suppliers and allocated a portion of the volume rebate uh, to the actual extension work. In some cases, brokerage fees were allowed and uh, margins on sales for you know, volumes allocated to loan reimbursements were allocated to the uh, funding system, and in some cases, uh, agreements with buyers actually to fund a part of the extension service were negotiated. But there's, you know, this plurality of formulas that was interesting, and that was permitted by the agency that the networks had and the knowledge level they had to develop something that fit their own circumstances. And I, well, I'm pretty encouraged by that. I'm pretty happy with that. They're doing well. Now, where are they going to go? Uh, so what's the future challenges? Well, the networks 
okay, they demonstrated a capacity to play a very positive role in the delivery of extension and more than that, value to farmers. I mean, that is what keeps them in business. The fact that they're getting value, value in terms of productivity, value in terms of market access, but also value in terms of risk reduction, which is one of the critical value points for the very small rain-fed uh, farmers that are challenged every year by a whole series of risks. Uh, there's an express need by them to uh, further develop the model to adapt to new crops and new services that would effectively leverage the power of digital technology. So there's a demand for new technologies, adapted technologies that accelerate the system. Uh, what we're seeing is that the inclusion of women farmers as fully empowered agents remains a challenge because of the size of the farm, but there are solutions that are there, but they, they really need to be, to be expanded and, and diversified. But they, they do have a market justification. Uh, all networks see the inclusion of their community's youth as an opportunity, especially as far as the you know, downstream organization of the activities, such as like data collection and the various tracking and management activities where youth really excel. However, networks, it should be said that net, these networks cannot replace the foundational need for public good knowledge and services that's provided by agronomic research or the regulation of, the, of seed quality and inputs or the production of meteo data or, and forecasts. Uh, these networks cannot either self-finance roads or improvements in rural IT, uh, nor uh, can they yet fully finance large-scale storage infrastructure. So government has to interact with these groups, and, and actually they've begun doing that in Senegal. That's what's interesting. I mean, they, there are clear platforms that have been developed between these farmer organizations and the various decentralized governance services, and that's very promising. Uh, USAID is also using these networks to, uh, to do, as part of their nutrition program, which gives them a more uh, resilience role uh, just by their skills and permanence in terms of organizing local capacity. So uh, finally, uh, what I want to say is that the level of self-organization these networks have achieved uh, can be leveraged by government to maximize the impact of public investment, and they can become effective relays of extension messaging, but beyond that, they are fully empowered value chain actors and have to, a role to play in that domain from now on. So, uh, okay, I'm looking forward to your questions and thank you for your attention. Great, thank you so much, Jean-Michel. Uh, let's see, we have had a couple of questions come in for you and then we'll open it up to some further questions for all three of our presenters. And we have about 15 minutes left for questions. Um, so Jean-Michel, Mark Blackett asked, is the farmer-owned database system available for others to use in ongoing or new projects to help prevent reinventing the wheel in this case? Yes, well, uh, what I want to say is that there is no uh, software that for that market farmer-owned database system. It's actually a hack, a hack of uh, various uh, Excel, Dropbox, and other softwares. Uh, the more advanced will work with the open source uh, Comcare platform, uh, which was uh, re-engineered uh, into a, an agricultural extension activity uh, system, and that also is uh, available on open source on the web. Uh, it's more skills here that, that's required. It's not the, the software itself. Various applications have been developed and plugged into these systems, but they, they are independent and freestanding uh, as we speak. So they, they are available. Uh, there will be documentation on what they, they represent. They, that will be available, but the, the approaches are, are really open source and based on making sure that you have people who can manage the data at the local level. And this is where uh, having farmers that are able to handle Excel, having uh, you know, locally based people that can even do uh, 
pivot tables and doing pretty sophisticated analysis really uh, makes it a very, very resilient system. One of the most popular apps now that was a byproduct of the digital expansion we did is actually WhatsApp, you know. And uh, there's a, I think there's a lot of, uh, of work to be done in how to hack together uh, interesting application using uh, either social media or generic uh, software. Uh, great, thank you. An interesting question just came in from Sarah Huber. How were these farmer organizations in your example so high functioning? Were they selected carefully or was there some sort of significant training provided? And also uh, a separate question, how were the bank loans facilitated and what did they cover? Yeah, so that that's the question is always asked. Uh, some people often uh, talk about a Senegalese exception in terms of, of organizational development. I want to say that uh, an organization like FIPROMAS, for example, where you know, we had Nimna there talking about her thing, uh, is actually made up of uh, you know, 12 highly dysfunctional small farmer groups, but that at one point decided to join forces and ask us to be empowered and manage their own thing. Really, you know, it's not like we invented that. It was a reaction to a very dysfunctional uh, top-down extension system where the lead firm was actually taking advantage of, of its, pop, uh, its position. And the farmers told us, rather than dropping the program, what if we got together and provided our own extension? So the key word is motivation, you know, and then testing them. Uh, you want to have a basic legal structure. You want to have had a certain level of self-organization but then you want to give them a motive. Their initial motive will be productivity. Their initial, then it follows on as they see that the risk is reduced. They, they'll want to find markets. They'll want to find uh, financing. And this is where you, know, you have different little facilitation components that come in. But you really want to select the farmer organization that have a will to succeed. And uh, we did capitalize on the initial group of uh, 10 or 20 farmer organizations, but where locally it, it generated a series of, of applications and, uh, and buy-in. And, uh, and then the, the idea here is to provide continuity and really build them up over a, a period of time, but not in theoretical uh, capacity building, but capacity building that is oriented towards very clear value proposition by farmers, and that really, really creates uh, a momentum. Uh, for the bank loans, uh, well, the bank loans essentially for the farmer organizations cover inputs, okay? Uh, there's been other series of bank loans we facilitated for their clients. What's interesting with the bank loans is to, to develop the, the um, to make it happen uh, was to develop um, how can I say, collateral strategies and risk management strategies. And so this is where uh, inventory collateral systems, uh, not necessarily warehouse receipts, but collateral systems that are oriented towards quick trading. You know, warehouse receipt is about waiting. Uh, collateral uh, loans are more about securing the reimbursement by stocks that are then transferred on to a buyer, and there you have interlocking credit mechanisms. So that, that has been documented on the project. There will be further documentation on how we did that. But this system that secures the product by quality uh, uh, products uh, really is a very powerful way of growing, uh, of, of growing uh, loans, of growing finance in a secure way. Uh, ag insurance is also very important. I mean, the, especially for rain-fed zones, uh, having a system that protects the farmer and the bank uh, as to the loan reimbursement uh, against the climate events uh, was also a very, very powerful tool to, to boost volume in those areas. And uh, that's actually very popular with women's organizations uh, to protect the meager amount that they will put to adopt input. Uh, these kinds of index insurance based on rainfall uh, has gone a long way with them. It's actually very popular. 
Thanks so much, Jean-Michel. Um, we have about 10 minutes left for questions, but before we ask a few more, I wanted to open up our ending poll for all of you to answer. Uh, we'd appreciate if you would just take a moment to chime in on these polls and to let us know uh, how we can continue to improve our AgriLinks webinars going forward. And as a reminder for any of you who do need to leave early, we will be sending you the recording, the transcript, and some additional resources from this presentation by email and encourage you to share it with your colleagues if you think that they would be interested as well. All right, let's see. Um, so Jean-Michel, uh, we had a question from Stafford Francis Mambola about sustainability. What are the incentives for the network leaders to continue to maintain their networks after closeout? Are they paid, or and if so, who pays them? Well, <clears throat> the, the farmer, what's interesting with this is that the leaders are all farmers themselves, you know? So, so they have an interest in, in developing this pooling and this grouping. So, you know, they're not huge farmers, but they'll be farmers who who have graduated to from let's say two hectares to let's say 15 hectares. Some of them will, you know, own a tractor, and they they're actually you know very community-based people. And so for them, uh, you know, the the organization is not just a simple business venture. It, it does have a social aspect to it. Okay, and uh, and the the leadership is not just one person. It's usually a group of people and uh, who, who together, you know, manage this. So they make their money in their, uh, with their product. Uh, some of them are, let's say, certified seed producers, so the group also provides them with a, a ready market. And, uh, you know, they will get involved in sales and all that also. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's really a very grassroots uh, vision on things. And, uh, and then they, these organizations then negotiate with the outside world. But, you know, in terms of needs, uh, you know, they, they have income expectations that are very reasonable for people who are present in those communities and in those environments. And that's what makes it so powerful. It's the same thing for the field agents, people who, who know IT, understand IT, but are used to living in those conditions who do not want to migrate back to cities. Uh, thank you, Jean-Michel. And I think I'll talk uh, just one final quick question to you uh, from Judy Payne. Wondering if you capitalized on enabling farmers being able to compare their own data which of course would open up some questions. Why is that other farmer more productive than me? Um, comparing numbers could be an interesting way of promoting learning. And she was wondering if you did any of that. Yes, that, that was the big thing. That was it. You know, when, you, when the data is shared amongst the farmers within the community, not in the project, and then a guy's wife sees on, the, on a flip chart that she's actually making more than her husband in terms of maize production, well, that raises interesting discussions. And when you see that the neighboring network has higher yields, that creates also interesting discussions. So that's why, you know, this stage uh, discussion based on data was so important and really starting at community level. And we found that farmers actually can understand histograms. You know, I mean, they, they understand uh, distribution curves and things like that. They really do after a while, and they start talking into very precise terms. And so that's what's so powerful with it is that the, the data processing loop is very short, and the, the information remains within the community, but gradually also can, uh, is consolidated and transmitted to the government extension system also, and who actually prizes that data because it's so, it, it, it's actually very accurate. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, we have still about five minutes to squeeze in some questions. Um, I wish that we were, uh, we could keep going forever or that we were all networking in person because it's been so great to see the engagement that's been going on in the chat box 
some people challenging each other's comments, um, asking each other questions. It's, it's really wonderful. So thank you to our audience. You are the most important part of any AgriLinks webinar, and we really appreciate your engagement. Before we officially wrap up, um, I think I'll ask a, a question or two that came in closer to the beginning of our presentation that I think um, you know, still proves relevant. Let's see. Um, so a question from Elon Gilbert, uh, perhaps first directed at you, Kristen. In some countries, development projects seriously blur the lines between public and private extension, with HR moving back and forth, uh, which complicates the institutional strengthening and sustainability across the board. Are there any lessons from DLEC on this problem? Hi, yes, thanks for that question. I, I was just about to write the answer and I was hoping you were still on. But yes, we, we have seen this as a, as a big problem in many countries where, you know, there's this so-called uh, poaching or so-called brain drain, often people moving from the public sector to work for NGOs or projects or the private sector and so forth. And I, I guess I would say, um, two major lessons here. One is the need to strengthen both simultaneously. So we talked a lot about strengthening public and private sector, the producer organizations, the input suppliers, the, the public uh, people, and so forth. Secondly, this is an issue of incentives, and it goes back to the overall professionalization of extension and advisory services. And I think that's something many public services in particular need to pay attention to. And we have some examples from Uganda and South Africa on that related to regulation, certification, and all of these things. But incentives are so poor for rural extension agents um, who work for, for government or, you know, district or, or, or federal systems or whatever. This, this needs to be looked at and, and improved. Great, thank you, Kristen. Um, and let's see, perhaps, sorry, we've had so many great questions and we've been, I've been I think, answering as many of them as we could. And we will certainly um, be sharing the chat box transcript with the presenters after the fact in case there's any opportunity uh, to include a few more questions um, in our post-event resources. Uh, and I also have a few more that I will copy and paste um, some written answers um, as soon as we wrap up. So um, perhaps maybe the last question. I know that, uh, Jean-Michel, that you touched on uh, gender integra integration, but it's always it's a question that comes up in nearly every AgriLinks webinar. People are wanting more information about how to integrate gender concerns. Uh, into programming, yeah. and uh, Lilan Nikingla at the beginning asked, how do uh, extension advisory services ensure gender integration into their programs? Um, and there was someone who wanted you to just elaborate more on what you said. Um, so perhaps you could touch on, on a couple of important gender issues before we wrap up. Yes, uh, okay. Uh, one thing I want to say that was interesting is we checked the age of the uh, database and the field agents who work with data, and what's interesting is that uh, men were 30 years old on average, and women were actually younger. They were 28. And also what we saw is that even though in Casamance uh, women's literacy was very low, when you look at the younger generation, the, there's like a, a literacy surge for the, you know, the, the 10 to 18-year-old uh, who eventually become candidates for fu being future field agents and, and hold these kind of, of management capacity. So what I want to say is that even if, in, in, I mean, in the poorest countries, that's the case. And so I really encourage projects to be poised for that, for that little, that wave of, of literate and trained women, uh, like I said, you know, 10th grade is accessible, I mean, for pretty sophisticated data processing. You can, for field agent level, it can be less than that. And you really want to integrate them in there. One of the elements I was saying is that for women's organization, uh, women have 
generally smaller plot sizes and are concentrated in various pools of areas. And, and that requires having a strategy that's adapted to that. So, so that because they have less mobility. So you can have more, uh, you know, uh, responsible field agents per basin and uh, rather than having a multi-basin approach. So that's also another, another element. But I also want to say that uh, the, the strongest network leaders uh, are generally women. Uh, it's it's in, in the top management posts. Uh, that's been our experience. And uh, that's why you really want to, to promote that, that integration and all that. I think uh, another domain that can be very strong in bringing women into those extension systems is that those networks uh, want to co-op young people. And, uh, and very often, like, women's group will co-op young women. I mean, you want to make sure that that happens. What's important is, is really to, to promote that integration throughout the program and that's where projects have a role to play. But once they've been in the system for a few, uh, for a few cycles, the, the women then develop entrepreneurial programs. And a bit like what Robert was describing, you know, some of them migrate and, and can become uh, village agents uh, connected with banks, with insurance companies, with uh, input distributors. A, a bit like that. I mean, the networks are, are kind of a school, but they're also a ready market for those entrepreneurial businesses for youth. And, and women are very good in that. I just want to say that the young woman you saw in the slide I presented is now has graduated from being a, a database manager for a rights company and is now uh, created her own company as a, a rights aggregator. And she, she actually owns a car now. Wonderful. Thank you, Jean-Michel. Uh, all right. We are two minutes past the hour, so we're going to go ahead and officially wrap up this webinar. I would like to extend a sincere thank you to our presenters, to our participants, and to the AgriLinks team, who always supports these uh, webinars with enthusiasm uh, and excellent support. So thank you all for attending, and keep your eye on the AgriLinks newsletter for announcements for upcoming webinars. Thank you all, and have a great rest of your day.